Hello, uh, my name is Stefan Rosenschuk and I work in the uh, Magnets uh, group of the technology department of CERN. And today we want to uh, make a little recording concerning the machining and the design of um, end spacers for superconducting coils. And uh, this way we try to avoid some recurrent items that uh, show up in the, in, the, in the manufacturing of these pieces. Now what we are talking about here is a superconducting coil. They come, of course, in different lengths and so on and so forth. The uh, longest uh, coil that we have is the 13 meter long uh, dipole coil for the LHC. Now this is a dipole coil for a corrector magnet, but it um, allows here to explain some of the terms that we will uh, need. So this is uh, actually the, uh, the, the conductor itself. And here you see in the coil end region, you see these filler pieces, uh, usually made from uh, G11 class epoxy material. And uh, then we have two sides. One is called the connection side here, or the, re uh, the lead end, uh, where you see actually the, uh, the leads going in and out from the coil. And this is the symmetric part. It's the return end or non-connection side. And then we distinguish two different or three different sets of uh, spacers. This is the uh, central post here, which has only one machinable surface. Then are the ordinary spacer, and this we call the head spacer. Here the head spacer is the last spacer, which has only one concave side to be machined. This is just uh, a more... For the, this is actually for the LHC dipole, um, a uh, bigger uh, head spacer, which you see here with this uh, machine coil. And that's the head spacer of the lead end, where you see this asymmetry. And usually these lead end spacers, here I have another one, they have the additional complication that on one side they usually taper out into a zero size. So we need, of course, to see in the manufacturing that... Uh, this is being cut in an uh, appropriate uh, thickness. Usually in the specification we have 0.2 millimeters. We don't want to be too choosy about this. Uh, basically, uh, it has to be not too thick, but of course reasonable for the material that we are using. Uh, just here, before I continue, there is here a, uh, a central post where you see it's only one concave outer side to be machined. Uh, today, what we are talking about is a technical specification for the production of these pieces for a new project, which is an upgrade of the low beta triplets for the uh, LHC. Here we see, just for general information, the, um, the uh, uh, magnets in their cryostat uh, installed near CMS, near point 0.5, where you see the experimental cavern in the background. Okay, here we have an artist's view of the coil, uh, of the quadrupole coil, together with the end spacers here. And uh, this is the technical drawing that was sent together with the call for tender and the Katya files here to explain a little bit also again the terminology of the pieces uh, again these uh, two sets of spacers for one coil. You see this when, when we talk uh, about a coil. This is the inner and the outer layer coil of uh, the magnet. Here we have in a quantum pole four coils and the set of end spacers is now outer layer coil and inner layer coil end spacers, both for the connection and the uh, non-connection end. Uh, the recurrent item here is the manufacturing of these pieces. And uh, because we are winding with uh, so-called Rutherford-type cables, which is here a cable which resembles pretty much the Röbel bar known in electrical machines, uh, there is, of course, a difference in the flexural, flexural rigidity of the uh, cable. So we have really to, to make sure that when we wind this around the corner, uh, around the edge, uh, that uh, the best care is taken in order to support uh, firmly these uh, parts in the ends of the coil. And uh, these end parts of the coil have uh, in the past often been the limiting factor of the performance of the uh, magnets because the mechanical support is obviously not as good as it can be 
in the cross section. Now, the little bit of mathematics behind the, um, the fabrication of these end spacers. Now, first of all, uh, there's the theory of a space curve. Uh, basically, you know this all. Uh, this is uh, just a, a one dimension, dimensional manifold here described by the position vector in some three dimensional space. And then we can calculate the tangential vector, which is nothing but the velocity usually if this was uh, parameterized with respect to time. Uh, otherwise, the normalized velocity vector is uh, the tangent vector. Then the normal vector, which is related to the acceleration that you have as you travel along the space curve. And then some binormal vector, which is uh, orthogonal to both of them. Uh, these it's called the moving teardron, the triad or the Frenet frame. Now this Frenet frame spans three surfaces of which the rectifying plane is actually the most important for us. And it turns out later that when we bend a cable or here a piece of paper here, then you can see that the rectifying plane is basically this plane here which has to be machined. And uh, these uh, Frenet Serre equations here, they give us a set of coupled differential equations that we are actually solving in our computer code in order to design the shape of these end spaces. This brings us now to the uh, theory of strips because uh, uh, this uh, kind of cable is not just a space curve, but it will turn out that a geodesic strip, and this is a strip that once it is unrolled, is absolutely straight that this indeed can be described um, with just one uh, guiding edge, which is a space curve. Now, for this, we have a look here at the theory of strips. Now, it can, it, it, it's a little bit uh, a longer derivation, but it turns out that uh, the guiding, um, uh, the, the Frenet frame for strips is exactly then identical to the Frenet frame of the guiding uh, line here if um, the strip is geodesic and this is in this case if it is for example wound again on our helix you see here the strip and then we wind it on a helix and there you can see that this again here is now exactly the same we could describe it actually just as a function of our uh, lower edge of this strip and you would see then, if I draw here some uh, lines, some guiding strips, that then these will be exactly our so-called Dabu vectors, which we had before. You see now that these lines are straight lines, which are nothing but the uh, guiding lines of the cylinder on which this uh, uh, strip is drawn. Now we make use of this fact by designing actually now our strip to be bent around the uh, end of a magnet in this way. We describe it here now uh, as a function of its baseline, which we see here. This is usually an ellipse on a cylinder or a hyper ellipse on a cylinder. Here, together with the Darboux frame and the Frenet Sevre equations for this Darboux frame. And here again, we have the Darboux vector, which is now the guiding, the ruling here of the, um, from away from, the, from, from, from the, the, the baseline, the ruling of the developable surfaces. And now I would like to point you to something very important, which actually leads exactly to the errors which are being usually made in the machining of these pieces. There you see, if I wind this around here, then indeed the rulings which I have drawn onto the surface are not straight lines. You see this? So the equidistance the lines that I drew here onto this guiding strip are indeed not straight rulings. But of course, what is a straight ruling, or what will come out to be a straight ruling, are the lines like this. You see? 
They are now not equally distantly spaced on the upper and the lower edge. But once I start winding this around, there you can see that now, indeed, these lines are straight lines on that surface. And this is why this, this surface is called a ruled surface, which we can just uh, unrule. Or, uh, we, 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 we say we rectify it as we unbend it along these rulings and flatten it out. Of course, the whole thing looks a little bit different if we have a geodesic strip, non-geodesic strip, sorry, which, is, which has a certain curvature to it. And when we bend this around, you will see that we are just ending up at some different angles, slightly different angles in, in all what we bend. Nevertheless, we still find sets of rulings on these surfaces here, which are, again, straight lines.